I played basketball with a guy who was a couple years ahead of me in medical school. And this was end of second year. And he was going into this field called PMNR, which I had never heard of. So after him sort of telling me about it, telling me about this focus on function and uh, you know, the focus on the neuromusculoskeletal system and the kind of holistic look at patients and the long-term relationships with patients, it, I mean, it just, it was like a, a light was shining down and that was just the obvious choice for me. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Sandal, and I am a past president of the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. I am honored to have this opportunity to share with you a little of the history of physical medicine and rehabilitation. Physical medicine has been with us throughout human history. It includes the use of treatments such as heat and exercise for diseases and associated painful conditions. Dr. Frank Krusen, considered the father of physical medicine, coined the term physiatry or physiatry in 1938 when the American Academy of Physical Therapy Physicians, later renamed the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, was founded. Today, PM&R physicians practicing physical medicine treat muscle, bone, and nerve disorders as well as medical conditions utilizing non-surgical approaches. So I've taken sort of the kernel of PM&R of, of gait dynamics and physiology through EMG and the biomechanics that you learn with prosthetics and orthotics and have, have sort of taken all that, that knowledge and that foundation and tried to transfer that to overuse injuries in sports. If you look at the type of injuries that occur in sports medicine, most of them aren't traumatic and most of them don't necessarily require surgery. Rehabilitation medicine is the younger branch of PM&R. It has its roots in the early 20th century, beginning with World War II and the polio epidemic. Rehabilitation medicine uses comprehensive medical care to reduce the disabling effects of diseases and conditions. Dr. Robert Bennett, Frank Krusen's resident at the Mayo Clinic, became an early leader at Georgia Warm Springs, where President Franklin Delano Roosevelt received care for polio. Dr. Howard Rusk, considered the father of rehabilitation medicine, led the development of programs for veterans and civilian populations after World War II and the Korean War and increased the field's national and international influence. Today, physicians in rehabilitation medicine practice in inpatient and outpatient settings, often with clinical teams. They treat patients with many different diagnoses and complex conditions, including stroke, brain injury, and spinal cord injury. And with the women's clinic work, when we were working with OBGYNs, we had a uh, you know, team model that I think worked extremely well. If you've got a disabled um, woman with, say, spinal cord injury who's pregnant. We need the OB, but they need us. The practices of many PM&R physicians combine physical and rehabilitation medicine. Four out of the five days that I'm at the VA, I'm actually doing something different. Um, I also run a, I run a EMG clinic. Um, I have a musculoskeletal clinic twice a week. I run a wheelchair clinic. And I also uh, head a multidisciplinary um, polytrauma group, actually. 
at first I thought most of my practice was going to be spine related, so I was going to be seeing a lot of back and neck pain. But nowadays they just send me patients that they can't figure out what's going on and I have to help them make the diagnosis with imaging, EMG, nerve conduction, physical exam. PMNR researchers in past decades led the way. One of these researchers was Dr. Frances Hellebrandt. She studied exercise and the pathophysiology of muscle disorders. PMNR researchers today are finding many new areas of study that reflect the scientific foundations and goals of the field to maximize function, decrease pain, and improve quality of life for patients with many diseases and health conditions. Learning how to mesh biologics with our tradition of rehab and bringing it together in a cohesive way I think is so critically important to us. It's, it's coming. It's, gonna, it's going to be here. The era of biologics and biotechnology and genomics and proteomics. And if we can use these very powerful biologic tools to treat the patient and improve the quality of life, wow. We, we've done something huge for, for our community. The stories of our patients reflect the foundational values of the field and show a compassionate and comprehensive approach that acknowledges patient and family perspectives and goals. And she's been a quad since the age of 14. She's 45 or 46 years of age. And over the weekend since Sunday, she's noticed that she's losing a little bit of wrist extension. She has some pain, but not a lot, but she's very alarmed by this loss. Of Where's it coming from? And I'm thinking, how am I gonna how am I gonna make sure this this orthopedic surgeon understands what functional loss will mean for this woman? Her independence is, is gonna be lost here if we don't do something. He said, let's do this. Send her down here, we'll admit her. I'll get the MRI at midnight, which he did. She had an operation by eight o'clock the next morning, she had her strength back when she came out of recovery. We had a young wrestler when I first came to Washington, D.C., whose dad actually was the head of the FDA at the time, filming him as he got thrown on his head and broke his neck. And then subsequently went on to arrest and was revived, helicoptered in, had surgery and so forth. And then ultimately, he started to move things. So he started to move and he started to walk a little bit and uh, got out of the hospital and I just saw him again as a patient and uh, he was talking and he said I just played the Haydn trumpet concerto and I said I play the trumpet too and he said I'm having trouble with the first and third valve with my hands and I said well what we should do is get you a fourth valve you can get those kinds of trumpets and he said and I have trouble tuning the one slide and I said I've got a trigger on one of my trumpets I'll bring it in for you and we started to play trios together. This mother of this patient was not formally educated, but loved her baby to pieces. And she reminded me why I picked this field. I empowered her to speak when previously she'd have been silent. There was a physician, a pulmonologist that came in and told her, well, we want to talk about some stuff that we're going to do with his ventilator, but you don't need to know about all that. It's really too complicated for you to have time with. And she, because of our conversations, because I'd said, you're my partner in this, felt empowered to say to that pulmonary doc, no, you're not doing anything to my child that I don't understand. And if you can explain it to me, I'll ask you questions about the parts that I need help with, and I'll read about the parts that I don't know. But you're not leaving here doing something to me as opposed to working with me. That is physiatry. The American Board of PMNR certified 91 physiatrists in 1947. Now more than 10,000 physiatrists have been board certified and the American Academy of PMNR has more than 9,000 members. Even with this growth, there are not nearly enough PMNR physicians in the United States and abroad to treat the growing numbers of patients who need physiatric care. We need about uh, 15,000 
new member join in our field because China has got a 1.3 billion population. We have only six uh, physiatrists in, in Ireland for the whole of the nation. So it's, it's a huge um, job. There are long waiting lists. We need colleagues. The numbers of patients that have cardiac and pulmonary disability far outweigh pretty much every other population that we treat in rehabilitation, barring, I guess, back pain or musculoskeletal injuries. I consider myself a brain injury specialist, and I see soldiers um, uh, from Iraq or Afghanistan. We really need to train more brain injury specialists who will have more exposure and develop more expertise in military-related or combat-related brain injury. And of course, for me, it's Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, for, for physiatrists around the world, it's going to be you know, their, countries, their countries of interest. And then why Sub-Saharan Africa? Because there are only seven physiatrists in Sub-Saharan Africa. Seven physiatrists are not going to cut it, especially when the majority of the care that's required is non-surgical. Many more PM&R physicians will be needed to meet the needs of patients with acute and chronic conditions and those with injuries sustained in armed conflicts, natural disasters, vehicular crashes, and sports. A comprehensive PM&R research agenda must address the health and functioning of all of these diverse populations across the globe. In the words of Dr. Howard Rusk, we have a world to care for. This country has a long history of disability issues being debated on the highest levels of government. World War II was a great time for physiatry. I feel that nowadays, because of the World Report on Disability recently coming out, it's a fantastic time for physiatry because on the highest levels of international debate, the discussions are pivoting around disability issues. And disability now is a separate line item on par with infectious disease, on par with early mortality, et cetera. And so it's an awesome time for young physiatrists like me with a view for how physiatry can be used to champion social inclusion. Mm -hmm.